to Fantasy Underground. This is week two, waiver wire, or 10 transactions. I'm still trying to figure out a catchy name for this thing, but it's 10 things you can do this week to improve your fantasy roster. It was a slower week, not as exciting of matches, but what good is YouTube and what good is the internet if I can't come up with 10 things even when there aren't 10 things? I do not want to waste too much of your time today, so lay out for the show. We're going to go through the 10 transactions, and then after that, jump into my thoughts on the remaining teams that hadn't played yet. Uh, London, Hangzhou, Boston, Paris, and New York. I've also got a theory to run by you guys as I'm trying to figure out next steps here. So let's get to it. Um, Top 10 list, here we come. As with last week, I want to pop up my 10 transactions for the week. And I will read through all 10 of them here for those that are just audio listeners. Number one for the week is picking up Jinmu. Number two is picking up Flora. Number three is uh, either waiver wire pickup or selling high on Oni God. Farway 1987 is droppable. Bebe is a buy low. Godsby, do nothing. Uh, number seven is selling high on Elivote. Number eight is buying low, real low on Punk. Number nine, Valentine being a waiver pickup if he's still free. And number 10, buying low, real low on Shacks. Now, I know from reading other people's thoughts this week, browsing Reddit, etc., that some of these are not going to be popular. But I'm not here to be popular. I'm here to give you my thoughts. Agree with me, disagree with me. Maybe you hate this list. Let me know. But here's my rationale. Let's get to it. So first on my list is going to classic Jinmu. Now, I've been back and forth on Jinmu and Flora as who I see is the better week one pickup. I've settled on Jinmu, and I know I'm late to the party here, later than Watson, who last week was in love with Jinmu, noting him as the best player in the entire world. And while I don't agree with that, I do think we're kind of getting back to some classic Jinmu here. Chengdu has kind of always been their best, and I know things are a little bit different this year. But they've always been their best when they're pushing the envelope, when they're stretching the boundaries. And Gaga is doing that, much like Ameng did last year, just better. All the pieces are better, and even when they look human and they start losing some matches this week, this team is often built around Jinmu. His Fara is incredibly unique, as you saw in this clip, and frankly, he's he's a very dangerous player. Uh, obviously, his Sombra is not so good but he's very frequently getting high value out of high damage heroes and racking up those fantasy points. So he's always a little bit of a risk. We know Jinmu. He's he's number one in our hearts. And this week, he's number one in the waiver wire pickup column, if he is still there. Sorry for being late on this one, everybody. One more quick Jinmu clip, because I love him. Bianca comes flying at him with self-destruct enabled here. The camera doesn't quite catch the clip for us, but he flies forward and kills Bianca before he uh, he can even remack. Then he's crazy enough that he's trying to take the enemy Ivy Echo in a duel. This is Jinmu, and we love him for it. Number two on the list belongs to Flora. Now, besides the fact that he can't shoot a piece of dynamite, and that many of you seem to hate this guy, from my eye test, I really like what he brought to the table. Now, Okay, never mind. That actually is the right clip. I'm not going to edit that. I'm going to leave it in there. Jinmu Farah doing Jinmu things, but Flora's on the other side of things. And what we see from Flora is a nice triple tap there on leave. Does what he needs to against Gaga here. And then helps with the cleanup effort as well. We're not seeing amazing plays, amazing flicks that break your brain. Like when Guangbong does it. We saw Guangbong come in for Volskaya. Only one time this week, and I'm not going to lie, he made a few of those crazy flick shots in what I saw. One was caught on camera, and the other one I guess I can't call it a crazy flick shot because I didn't get to see the first person view. But he got a two kill as New York was losing. That was pretty amazing. That uh, allowed them to retake, or that allowed them to take the first point. Now, we don't see that same accuracy here from Floor. We don't see the insane mechanics. But this is where I want to test my theory with all of you. Flora got the most play time. And right now, we're seeing a complex meta where you have to be able to play against Ball, you have to be able to play against Monkey, you have to be able to play against Ryan and Arissa. The players with a lot of experience in Overwatch who still have strong mechanics are going to be the most successful players here. 
we see things like the Philadelphia Fusion doing well. Gwang Bong's not getting much playtime. Kaylee is looking really bad. Maybe it's a small sample size. But my, my theory here is that right now, the players that have that solid experience playing across multiple metas over various eras in Overwatch have a nice advantage right now. It doesn't hold up everywhere you look at it. Don't look too closely. But I've seen enough from Flora that I'm impressed. In my New York video that I did before the season started, I wrote him off. And I didn't even rank Flora because I didn't like his hit scan play enough. And I'm still not saying it's the best I've ever seen. But he's a smart player. Um, his Sombra does continue to look very, very impressive. And when you have elite level talent at a specific hero, and you can still play all the others at a competent level, you're going to get some playtime. Going back to Guangbong, when he was in, we saw a few deaths, first deaths, where he was just pushing those boundaries a little bit too far. And I feel like New York can trust Flora. I don't love the short-term value. Um, for this week, I do. For week three, I do. But beyond that, once we're in hero pools, if things simplify a little bit or there's a more defined meta because of limited heroes, I do think he could suffer from that. So this isn't a strong endorsement. This isn't go use your top waiver claim. But I do know in one or two places I'm looking to pick up Flora and I'm hopeful that this is a you know valuable DPS. But to be honest, not sure. It's a weak, sorry, it's, it's a poor week for waiver wires. Not a weak week. It's a poor week for waiver wires. Flora's number two. Take it or leave it. I'm not offended if you don't pick him up. It's not, you know, you don't, not every team needs to pick him up. But if you need a DPS, I think he's a contributor for week, for week three, and I'm much higher on him than the market is. Oni God comes in at number three for the week. I do not love this player. Here we see him demacking Fried Wiener, killing Shredlock, and then he takes the duel against Dalton. Congratulations, you outduel Dalton. You're this week's number three waiver wire pickup. Um, I don't, I don't have a strong endorsement of him here, but he seems to be the short-term starter here. And for good enough reason, his hit scan is good enough. And this is a meta that strongly favors those short-range McCree players. I do not love his long-term value because from what I saw from Suna, I actually kind of like his tracer. And I don't know that his value holds in the short term. So if you need a player for week three, you could do worse than Oni God. If you can sell high on him based on him having just had a big week, I'd highly recommend doing so. Try to get a little bit of value for him from someone who says, oh, Paris players did well. They're good. I love Khan. That's the kind of person that you want to try and sell Oni God to as a valuable fantasy player. I know I've got him in a couple places and I am going to be pushing out some trade offers because I do not want him for the long term. Week three, though, you could do worse than starting him. Maybe it's mean to hate on him, but I saw plays like this multiple times where he tries to push the boundaries. He tries to make the play, and he just doesn't. Had he hit his shots perfectly, he would have made something happen here. But this is just a, such a risk to take. He dies, and there's enough deaths here that the outlaws are actually able to have a surprise hold. But at the end of the day, it's just it just it doesn't feel good. Like Oni God makes these flanks. You can see that he's not perfect. Once again, maybe it's a ping thing, maybe it's not. But right now, things aren't clicking for him, and I just I don't see the long-term play here. Missing some key shots. He's countered, he's in too deep, and cost his team quite a bit there. For number four on the list, pour one out for one far away, 1987. Here's the double purple from Monk, who then gets a very nice sleep coming up here shortly on Ivy which leads to a free kill. Game after game, I am loving what I see from Monk. And as much as I still, in my heart, love Faraway 1987, I can't justify it right now. So I'm now in a position where I was wondering if he would get some play time. He hasn't yet. Monk is looking fantastic. And while there's always the possibility he comes back in, I absolutely loved him preseason. Monk is the man. Number five transaction of the week is buy low on Bebe. What do you mean exactly? Well, <laughs> I know that um, I know that this isn't exactly a buy low. Like, wow, Bebe had a terrible week in his first Overwatch match. But I really liked what I saw from Bebe. He was many times the reason why his team won team fights. He's not there in the back just left clicking Decay and healing him. In this case, he's getting a four-man nade which I realize is very doable against a Monkey Diva comp, 
but he's often doing it from interesting locations, and this is Hanbin we're talking about. He was regularly nading Hanbin, who is fantastic diva. Um, a lot of it comes down to Bebe's angles, Bebe's approaches, and he was throwing a lot of unexpected nades. Washington had a pretty solid fantasy week, so you may not be able to convince someone else that Bebe's terrible, um, but I still feel like his name value is not what his current matching his current value. I think he's playing very well, and he is very much contributing to the Justice's success. He's not along for the free ride. In this case, if you watch carefully, Bebe has a very clutch nano that keeps his teammate Fury alive in the midst of an EMP. In what would have otherwise been a lost fight, it gives Assassin a window to counter EMP, and Fury stays alive, has some of that charge, uh, and, and gets some work done. So Bebe with a fight-saving nano, potentially, just plays left and right. And not to mention the purple rain from earlier. Um, he's he's going to be Bebe Prince for me here in the short term with all the purple rain and all the, the nades that are coming down. Terrible joke. I apologize. I love Bebe. I'm going to be trying to trade for him for people who don't yet think that he's a good player, but that he's just an average guy along for the ride. I'll get into a rant on the Spark leader. In short, I'm not a huge fan of what I saw from really any of their players, except for MCD and Bernard. In this particular case, uh, Godsby just misses some shots. I know that there was a little bit of talk about lag. Maybe that's contributing here, maybe it's not. You know, it's not entirely for me to know. The Spark came out and said, don't blame the lag. Could be a PR thing, but even lag or not, I just, I didn't like what I saw from any of the DPS. And sorry, I take back what I said earlier. Architect looked good. Architect always looks good. I love him as a player. But they rotated Godsby in. They rotated Shy in. They even put in Solman Su, which I wasn't expecting. Whoever they put in looked very average. And I worry for the Spark team. I think that second DPS slot is going to be a weakness. They've now fired their coaches, and there is certainly a possibility that that means change is coming on who's getting playtime. But frankly, whoever's in that second slot, I don't see them as being good enough to lock down all the playtime. And I don't have enough faith in Godsby's last performance, despite having a decent fantasy match. Not great, or decent fantasy total. Not great. I don't trust Godsby. If, if I were you, I would not be picking him up right now. Next on deck is Elivote who had a very, very good fantasy week, as did many of the Paris players. Um, I don't quite believe in Paris. I actually think they're decent, but I'll talk about them at the end. Specifically on Elivote here, Elivote once again showed a lack of hero diversity. In many situations, Elivote felt pretty useless against a May symmetric combination where the D.Va just isn't going to be as good but Elliot continued to hard lock that hero. He's a great diva. I, I, maybe not great. He's a very good diva. If we look at the numbers, I bet he is near the top, if not at the very top for ults eaten. But across the board, he just he hasn't been able to play anything except the diva and the Zarya, um, even when the situation has called for Sigma play. So Elliot, high fantasy total, mediocre player. Playing the lower value D.Va compared to other off tanks. And his Zarya just isn't ra- going to be racking up the same points as others. I'm afraid for the future of Paris. And Elivote is one of those reasons. On a personal level, one of my favorite players. I also loved how many ults he ate this weekend. But unfortunately, those aren't going to get you any fantasy points. In the last clip, we saw Elivote generally getting destroyed on a poor composition. And not really having a good dive target. In this particular one, you have to watch him carefully. And you see some of his ult eating capabilities here. KSF um, had a bit of a rough map, but did in this particular play snipe Oni God. I believe he gets a second one here. And Paris is sitting in a nasty 4v6 scenario. KSF, even then, just to make sure things go well, runs up to the cart. You see Elivo on the opposite side just stalling, but as soon as he hears the May animation or the May sound, he goes in and dives in and eats it. KSF, no ult. And Paris actually makes this into an interesting fight thanks to Elivote. So, not a bad player, but I do think he's a mediocre off-tank who is very limited in the heroes that he can play, and unfortunately, that being the lower-value ones. Next on deck, we've got the Boston Uprising. 
I am 37 might be worth a quick fill for your team. Thought his uh, hit scan play was solid enough and we didn't see any color hex, which was doubtful to begin with anyway, but I'm here to talk about one punk. Here we have a Graviton Flux, probably not the most exciting clip, but I do like uh, I do like punk in what was a very disappointing week for Boston fans. I am not bearish on them yet. They had two incredibly tough matchups, being that against the Gladiators and the Fuel. And at times in both of those matches, they looked quite good. There were also plenty of times where they looked very bad as well. But Punk stood out to me as being a strong player, and I can see why GBS did not play. That's not to say it will stay that way, because after getting wrecked twice in a row 3-0... Bad things could happen. They could shake things up. But Punk on his Zarya was often inflicting some pain and on his Sigma as well. He has a lot of hero flexibility and I don't see him as being a weakness on this team. So when I talk about Punk here, many had the assumption that Gabolshi was going to be playing full time last week. That was what I thought as well, but I did caution that it wasn't a guarantee. Uh, thankfully, I didn't start him, but in one draft royale out of my, the many that I did... Um, not buying in entirely. Punk's a good player. Don't forget that. If someone's looking to drop him or you can get him for someone else you would have otherwise dropped, I like the idea of stashing Punk. I think week three will be a lot better for Boston. And I'm not highly confident, but I think this team is going to have a much more positive narrative after their rough schedule in week two and simpler lineup in week three. I forget who it's against. We've got the Washington Justice, which will be a tough one, but we've also got the London Spitfire. So I do expect, you know, probably a one in three team, but if they destroy London and I think they have the capability of hanging a little bit closer with Washington, I think it could be a much more positive week for this team. Continuing the Boston theme at number nine, I'm saying hold on to Valentine. This is another player that a lot of people said his Echo looked terrible. Um, his Tracer looked terrible. And I would counter that with the composition Boston had in this map didn't make a lot of sense. Valentine gets pushed away, somehow manages to take down Honden with the support of some heals. Good maneuvering to get in range of those heals, but he takes down Honden 1v1. Not a terrible play. It's just at the same time, uh, Dallas just runs on top of the Uprising. So it feels like this is not how this comp is supposed to be played. I like what I'm seeing from Valentine. Um, if you watched any of my preseason videos, you know that I'm a big fan of his Echo. And while we haven't seen enough of his other heroes, he did play the Tracer. And when he wasn't getting absolutely mercilessly ruined by uh, hacks from Doha, his Tracer wasn't too bad. He was hanging in there with Sparkle, who, um, you know, is a fairly average Tracer, but at times has looked good on the hero. Um, I think... Valentine uh, is, you know, seeing him play the Tracer rather than Color Hex means he's going to be in there a lot. And I expect better days from Boston. So I'm still hanging in there on Valentine. Maybe I'm staying in there too long, but I, I did like what I saw from him. Um, I don't have a clip here, number 10 for Shax. He's my number 10. Buy low and buy real low. I don't see a lot of value for him in this stage. I think a lot of people are going to be very frustrated by what they saw from London. And I think this meta, as much as people say rushes for them, hybrid has looked uh, a little bit weak to me. I think London is going to have to learn how to play around Shax, and they're going to get to a more favorable meta here in the future where that Tracer can stand out a little bit more, where his Reaper gets a little bit more value. Um, it may be optimistic on my part, but I saw enough flashes of old Shaxx that I still believe he's there. We did see some, you know, not old Shaxx as well. I don't even know what to call it. So there's some risk there. But once again, if you can get him for pennies on the dollar, he's one of those guys that after what I expect to be a very poor week three from London, he's going to be a forgotten name by stage two. And if you can get him for very, very cheap there in the hero pools, don't limit the Tracer or the Reaper then I'll be looking to have him as a uh, a little bit of a sleeper for the second stage. That being the end of the 10 transactions section, I did want to give a brief uh, monologue here on the teams that we saw uh, with a quick, uh, a quick summary of all of them. London for me is the first, and 
you can see some of their trademark teamwork here, where there's just, you know, it's a simple flashbang shatter follow-up, but it's executed very crisply. They're able to play around the fact that at a mechanical individual skill level, their players are a little bit weak, but they can come up with strategies and ideas that work. I do like their tank line. I don't love it, but I think both um, Hadi and Bullfig showed why, you know, they, they're, you know, they're the backbone of this former Hurricane roster. Um, Blase on the May, Hybrid on the McCree, both were very underwhelming. Kellex as well, I've not liked very much. Ripa actually looks okay to me. A lot of people saying this is, you know, one of the worst, if not the worst, backline. Maybe it's true, but I have a lot more love for Ripa right now than some others do based on some of the individual plays that he made. So I still have some hope for this team, not for this stage, but once again, they hit the right meta where Shax is able to shine. Their tank line can do what they do. And, you know, maybe you can throw some Doomfist or something else in there. I still somewhat believe in the London Spitfire. Hangzhou, on the other hand, I really don't know what to make of this team. Architect, as always, looks good. MCD had a very nice performance. And in this particular clip, he's getting a nasty purple on the back line. That prevents Alarm from healing. And so Architect is able to get the pick. Um, we also saw Bernard, who I'll fade to here. And he has one of his uh, dinner specials here where he eats the blizzard, basically reads Rascal's mind, who you would think is one of our smarter May players. Bernard does his job. So in thinking about the spark, you know, this particular team fight I got all excited about because at the start of the match at 0-0, it looked like they might force a third point here. The entire rest of the weekend went downhill, unfortunately, but there were flashes from MCD, from Bernard, from Architect. Gushui is a main tank. Uh, I don't know. I, I'm not excited about it right now. Um, the DPS rotation, not so much. IDK, not so much. They've already fired Coach Noru, who they hired exactly one month ago. He had a one-month stint with the team. They've already gotten uh, switched out head coach responsibilities. There could be a roster shakeup here. They have a giant roster. This is an expensive team, and they can't afford to look like this. So roster changes wouldn't shock me. A full Korean or a full Chinese lineup. Wouldn't surprise me, but with MCD looking as strong as he did, with Bernard looking as strong as he did, I don't buy that Liga gets full playtime or Coldest gets full playtime. So tough situation, not very optimistic with where this team's headed organizationally right now. I think I talked about Boston enough. This is such a brutal play where they just are not ready for Dallas's strats. Dallas, you know, teleports right on top of them and just eats their lunch here. It was messy. Boston honestly felt a little bit outcoached or, you know, from a strategy standpoint. They were trying to do things that didn't make sense to me and they didn't adapt well mid-match either. So very, um, I, when I look at the individual pieces, Myunbong, Punk, Stand One, I Am 37 Valentine all made a lot of nice plays. Um, Faith, uh, main support wise, I, I did not think had a good week. But at the same time, I do like the results I saw from him in contenders. So I think better days are ahead for Boston, but they just, they felt outcoached, outstrategized in this particular matchup. To me, that's something that is hard to fix, but with the skill they've got, I believe in Boston still. It was fun seeing Washington back, and um, outside of Jerry and Assassin, and even Decay all sitting from time to time, um, the lineup was pretty consistent and uh, valuable here. Jerry looked very good on the hit scan. The this performance we saw from him back in the scrim continued. You see some sharp shooting from him. Decay is doing Decay things as expected, and I think I really think this is a three-man DPS rotation. Um, I think I might have under or overestimated Tuba's potential impact uh, since we didn't see him. This team feels pretty well covered between Valentine, Decay, and Jerry. Sorry, not Valentine, Assassin. Um, Assassin, I feel like Plat Chat hyped him up a little bit. He definitely had a very nice debut, but he didn't look like some world-beating DPS. So I do expect more of the three-man DPS rotation, and I expect the Justice to continue to pound here. Paris, Paris, Paris. Um... I like what I saw from this team. I consider them to be the Don Khan Naga show. Kind of rolls off the tongue a little bit. Don very much impressed me on the main tank. Very aggressive play style, but pulled back when he needed to. Um, I had a lot of doubts, but he I do not see as a weakness for this team right now. Um, 
Khan is getting a lot of love and well deserved. And in this particular clip, he makes sure to get, you know, at least one of his eliminations. He had a monster fantasy week. I do think that people are a little bit juiced on him right now. I mean, he's good, but he's not a league best flex support. At least I don't think he is. His Baptiste is very good. His Ana is very good. Um, we've got another clip of him right here on the Ana. And right here he lands, you know, an important two-man nade. Uh, he he hits a couple key shots uh, from his perch up here. I like I like Khan. Just, you know, don't take the love too far. Paris is, they, they might look bad in some of these upcoming games. But um, they they look to be, you know, we, we paired them with London. And they certainly look better. And I find that it's off the back of uh, Don Khan and Naga, who um, we only saw him on the May. But his May was pretty solid. And I can't wait to see, you know, what else he brings to the table. And even then, as I mentioned earlier, Suna, who just had uh, a really, really bad 2020. Um, now that we see him on the Tracer, who's his hero, um, I do think that we're going to see a, a fair amount of Suna in the upcoming year. Last but not least, I still believe in the New York Excelsior. They had a very rough showing against Chengdu, but they... <sighs> I don't know why I still believe in New York so much. Part of it is the Scrimbox exchange. I think that they were probably a little bit overhyped, but I've been finding that the right answer is usually somewhere in between. Um, Yakpung looks like a good all-around tank. Flora had a very impressive showing as a uh, DPS to support Ivy. And although Jonak had some weak moments, he's still Jonak, and he still made a lot of plays, more than he was given credit for this past week. So... Um, New York did have, uh, you know, <laughs> Chengdu happens, and they did soundly uh, beat the Spark. So I'm still somewhat hopeful in this uh, New York roster. I'm not out on them yet like a lot of other people are. Um, Ivy on the May is still absolutely one of the best at that hero. So with, uh, with more to come from their DPS rotation, more possibilities, I think there's still a future out there for this team. So there you have it. That's week two, waiver wire in the books. Um, coming up for the show, um, I'll have to see what I'm doing after week three. Probably more of the same, but it depends on what waiver stuff is out there. So if you have any particular topics you want addressed, I very much love my audience here. Thanks for watching. Any specific players you want me to uh, review um, or any other uh, content you'd like to see, I'm happy to jump in the replay reviewer and address that. If there's other more pressing topics after week three, I will have to address those, but if it's a if it's a pretty mellow week, I'll definitely uh, try to get to you know mailbox type items here. So please do leave a question or comment either here or on Discord. You know where to find me. Don't really care about the algorithm, uh, but you know you know you know where to find me. Um, that said, after the stage is done and we're in playoffs, uh, we'll still cover those matches uh, a little bit more loosely. Um, but on top of that, uh, I'm a little bit behind on my stats. I want to start getting you guys more stats. Just been a little bit limited on time. Uh, you know, side hobby here. Stats are kind of hard for me, but I will get there. So more stats to come soon. Thanks for tuning in. Really appreciate you all, uh, you know, making this a lot more fun for me. One of the best parts of my week. Uh, so much fun. So thanks for listening. Have a good one, everybody.